Big Brew for National Homebrew Day is coming up on Saturday, May 5th. Celebrate the best hobby in the world with your fellow brewers and raise a glass during the worldwide simultaneous toast at 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. To find a Big Brew event near you or to access free promotional resources for your own Big Brew event, visit the American Homebrewers Association's website at homebrewersassociation.org. That's homebrewersassociation.org. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, April 26th, 2018. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Steve Wilkes shares his latest round of delicious meads. This time, it's three fruited meads, or melomels, one with oak, and a revisit of a sizer to see how time is treating it. Go to basicbrewing.com. You can find archives of our audio and video shows, our DVDs, our brewer's logbooks, and other basic brewing gear. And you can get free stickers with every order. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and find our show page on Facebook. We have a cool Basic Brewing app on iTunes and Amazon.com, and we're found all over the place where fine podcasts are served up. If you'd do us a favor of rating us on iTunes and maybe leaving a nice comment, they say that'll help new listeners to find us. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And thanks very much to everybody who's done that. This week, I uh, brewed a two-gallon batch of robust porter, or stout, maybe, that I think will be delicious. It's uh, based on an extract recipe that you may have seen on Basic Brewing Video. It's uh, the Robust Coffee Stout from May of 2017. Well, back then I used some Maris Otter liquid malt extract and some light dry malt extract for fermentables. But this time I decided to go all grain and replace the extract with 6 pounds or 2.7 kilograms of Maris Otter, uh, the grain and not the extract. Um, With that, I added half a pound or 226 grams each of chocolate malt, brown malt, and black patent. I say it's a porter or a stout. Because uh, when I brewed the original recipe, I was calling it a porter, but Steve said on the show that he thought it was more of a stout. So we'll see how this one goes. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that I, I'm i doing this all grain because uh, a few of you guys who have watched that uh, video said, how do I, you know, what would you replace to do, uh, how would you replace the extract in that recipe to do an all grain version? And I've been telling people, uh, you know, use six pounds of Maris Otter. And so that's what I did. And the gravity, my, my gravity actually turned out a little higher than the extract batch. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, my plan uh, is to split the batch and bottle half of it plain as just a robust stout or porter. And then on the other half, add some smoke flavor. So I got this stuff... Uh, it's a liquid alder smoke. Uh, called It's called Chili Sweat from a company in Seattle, and it's a pretty cool stuff. The aroma that it has is very smoky, but the flavor is mild and not at all, you know, kind of astringent and uh, ashtray-like at all. <laughs> so I'm hoping that'll bring a nice smokiness to the beer, and I think it will go well with barbecue. And by the way, I shot some behind-the-scenes stuff that I plan to edit together for a bonus video for uh, our legacy PayPal, PayPal subscribers and uh, Patreon subscribers of the $5 level. So stay tuned for that. And uh, we've got more videos uh, coming up. Um, I posted a video of, um, what was it? Oh, the No Boil uh, ju- Juicy Pale Ale, I'm calling it. I posted that on Monday. That was a really tasty beer, and lots of people are are really interested in that uh, in that process. Steve and I, on that same day, we shot uh, a video about my Instant Pot uh, rice pilsner. Uh, I used a rice that I made in my Instant Pot. And uh, also, we shot a video on my 30-minute rye juicy pale ale, or hazy pale ale, whatever you call it. <laughs> so those will be coming up in the next uh, few weeks. Uh, this past Sunday, I attended a presentation by Brian Sorensen, who you've, you've heard on this pro- program. 
uh, as uh, he talked about Arkansas brewing history to the Washington County Historical Society. It was a great talk, and I, I learned even more stuff uh, from listening to Brian. Uh, it took place at Apple Blossom Brewing Company in Fayetteville, and right now they've got a really nice uh, Berliner Weiss on tap. And uh, it's funny that the server warned me that, you know, this is a sour beer. Are you okay with that? And I say, like, oh, yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> And they had a nice uh, selection of syrups available, but I went commando and just had it plain. And it was uh, it was tart uh, and nicely so, but but very clean and very refreshing. So well done, Apple Blossom. I don't get out there. I don't get over there uh, enough. I need to do more. Uh, let's take a moment to talk about our friends and sponsors, Desiree and Dave of High Gravity in Tulsa. Uh, I know you guys are ordering electric systems from High Gravity with the Warthog controllers because you're email, emailing me with questions, uh, you know, before you pull the trigger, before you place that order. Uh, some questions are about the design of the electric Baruna bag systems that Steve and I use. And if you watch the video that Steve and I shot uh, doing a demo of my system, there are a few things that have changed. First of all, the temperature probe is now in the kettle instead of the lid. Uh, the controller has been upgraded to the Warthog EBC-130, which is much, much nicer. And I believe that Dave has upgraded the quick disconnects to allow better flow through. Uh, so, you know, the system is actually better than what you see on that video. Um, you might want to email Dave for details or look at the site for details. Uh, I've also gotten a couple of questions about mash efficiency with the system. And I get great efficiency, uh, you know, as good as I used to get with my old mash ton. And I think that's because I stir the mash every few minutes uh, during the mash rest. And uh, you can do that with brew in a bag and not have to worry about messing up your, you know, your grain bed or your loudering, you know, as you, as you would in a traditional mash ton. And uh, the best part of it all is that electric brewing takes the pain out of propane, I can brew inside or out, and I don't have to worry about the wind stealing my heat away from me. Uh, check out all the configurations of electric systems that will help you take the pain out of propane, too. From five gallons all the way up to two barrels uh, they have there to family-owned and operated highgravitybrew.com. And if you use the promo code EBC75BB, you can save 75 bucks on your electric gear purchase. That's at highgravitybrew.com. Okay, it's always fun to peek into the fermentation room at Steve's Brew Shop to see what's working. And there's usually an assortment of honey-based beverages in various stages of fermentation. And it's especially fun because I know Steve Wilkes likes to share. Well, Steve Wilkes of Steve's Brew Shop, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks, James. It's a pleasure to be back. We, uh, it's time for a mead update. Every now and then you, you uh, work on a bunch of meads, and they all come to fruition about the same time, and, <laughs> and it's time to sample. Uh, and it seems like a good, uh, good reason to get together and, and sample these and talk about them and see what you've been up to. Well, yeah, and so I appreciate the opportunity to be on the show again. And um, we shot, what, three videos earlier today? Yeah. That was fun. So now the pump is primed in terms of <laughs> <laughs> the levity. So I, I brought uh, several meads with me tonight, and they're meads that I'm working on. They're all in various stages of um, readiness, you might say. So I just bottled up some little samples. I actually pulled samples out of the carboys uh, with a wine thief and then filled these little – see that we don't have uh, – What's, what's that stuff called? Video? <laughs> <Or> photos. <laughs> yeah. So I, I filled little little uh, Coke bottles, kind of. Mm. Aren't these neat? Anyway, so I brought a uh, tart cherry mead, uh, which is a little 7% mead, mm. uh, which I have in my hand. And then a, a blueberry mead that I've been working on, which is actually based on the three-gallon mead kit that I sell. Mm. So if you're new to mead making, I don't, I don't mean for this to sound like a commercial, though I know it's going to. <laughs> if, you're, if you're new to mead making and you're just not quite sure what you want to make, or I've got a kit that's already put together and it's got, you know, seven and a half pounds of honey and the nutrient, the appropriate amount of nutrient and energizer, 
the appropriate yeast, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of like a beer kit mm. that you would get. But it's a three-gallon batch. And uh, so anyway, I made that kit, and then I racked it after it had done the primary fermentation. I racked it onto two gallons of Arkansas blueberries, wow. which I had in my freezer and thought I'd need to do something fun with those. So we'll taste that and see what we think. And then I also brought with me a... Um, great big it's all about a 14 percent cherry mead Woo. that uh i made a five gallon batch of and i split it in half and this has been on oak now for about two and a half to three weeks uh-huh. so i thought we could try it and um and then i brought a couple of others but if we get to those we will <laughs> and you're welcome to stay here tonight we've got a couch that you... <laughs> we've got a guest room <laughs> no we've got we've got small glasses and these are small bottles and yeah. we we're uh we actually took a break after we shot those videos and we sat and, and chatted for a while and and now uh back, we're back on an even keel so that we can uh start again <laughs> that's right we can and we can talk uh, without uh, being too goofy i hope so which is the one we're going to start with we're going to start with the the I'll call it cherry mead number one, and um, it's just a seven percent mead. So it it was an experiment uh, in my trying to develop some easy to make kits for folks mm. that uh, would be would be ready to drink in a quick amount of time as meads go. In other words, it, you don't need a year to make it. Um, that wouldn't be too alcoholic, and that's one of the things that let's say slows a mead down. Mm. That if it has a lot of alcohol, it takes a long time for it to be kind of smooth out. So 7%, uh, it's it's really a beer strength mead, uh, somewhat inspired by Ricky the Mead Maker, huh. a little bit. A little bit of that same kind of philosophy. And uh, so it's just me experimenting with melomels that would be fun for people to make. Um, as I recall, in fact, I've got my notes here. Uh, so it's a three-gallon batch, and what I used was a 49-ounce can or a three-pound can of Vintner's Harvest Tart Cherry Puree along with four pounds of Brewer's Best Wildflower Honey, so just the uh, commercial honey that I get from L.D. Carlson. It's a really high-quality honey. It's it's mm-hmm. good stuff. But four pounds of that, um, a little bit of diammonium phosphate or DAP, a little bit of yeast energizer, a little bit of pectic enzyme, and then uh, one packet of 71B wine yeast, it started at 10.50, and it finished at 0.996, so it's 7% alcohol. Mm. And uh, we'll taste this. In my tasting notes, I have down that um, it, the the mead was very light, I mean really light, uh, and lacked body. Mm. In, in my personal tasting notes, it, it, was, it tasted okay, but I wanted it to have a little more body, and I think maybe a 7% mead, at least the way I'm doing it right now, Maybe isn't quite enough. But what I did, in fact, here's my tasting notes from the 12th of April. Very dry, very light body, stabilized with a little sorbate uh, this afternoon at p.m. Uh, I'll flavor and back sweeten with 32, ounce, uh, 32 ounces of tart cherry juice, which I've done. Mm. Uh, and I've back sweetened it just a little bit just for this show. So the batch is still setting there. But when I bottled this up this afternoon to bring to the show... In the bottle, I added just uh, maybe a teaspoon of honey ah. just to see what we thought. So mm-hmm. this really is, we really are making mead right now, ah. if you think about it. Mm-hmm. It's like this is the process you want to go through when you're putting your mead together and deciding what to do with it. Initially, when I made this, well, the initial thought was I'm just experimenting to develop products for my store. But as I made the mead, I thought, well, this will be nice to carbonate because it'll be nice and light, make it a little sparkling mead when i drank the first sample of it i thought too thin it's just going to be a sparkling nothing so i decided that i would go ahead and pop the flavor back up with some cherry juice let that clear out for a while so kind of a secondary fermentation on this uh raw cherry juice organic cherry juice and then i would back you know you know use some sorbate stabilize it and then back sweeten it so i stabilized all of these about three or four days ago. Mm. And so today is the first time that we will taste them uh, and see what my tinkering has done. Mm. So let's try the first one. Yeah. Now, and I have a, a technical question. You you said the ingredients. Mm-hmm. You said, uh, you know, the the uh, the tart cherry puree and then the, uh, the honey. Mm-hmm. 
but did you just add water to get up to three gallons or did you add any water at all uh yeah sure so it's it's the uh, so I, I fermented the fruit in the primary which of course lightened the body a lot in other words had i added that fruit in the secondary i might not have needed to do what i did to, to add additional fruit you might say so no i it was four pounds of honey three pound uh tin of tart cherry puree and then enough water to bring it to a three gallon batch okay yeah all right yeah so cheers cheers mm, it smells good mm. i think that's that's delightful that's pretty darn good <laughs> that's really good it's very it's I wouldn't say it's very light, but it is light. It's not super sweet, um, but the cherry flavor comes through. Um, and it's not a Luden's cough drop. Mm. It doesn't have that fake cherry taste. Mm. It's 7%, so there's mm. plenty of get up and go in there. Yeah. It's a little bit tart, mm -hmm. which is good. Um, it's not, I wouldn't say it was watery. Mm -mm. Um but it is, it is, uh, what kind of wine would you compare that to? If you were to compare the, in, in wine terms, what, how would you describe the body of this, of this uh, mead? I would compare it to a, um, like a, a, a Moscato. It's, it, it, it's hmm. not too far distant from a, from a dessert Moscato. Now it's about the same sweetness level that I would expect from one of those, a pink Moscato. Or muscat or moscato, very similar to that. Um, not quite as sweet and cloying as a like a white Zinfandel that you can. It's mm. like everywhere. Right. This is way better than that, in my opinion. Uh, but this kind of drinks like a really nice Italian moscato. And you, uh, yeah. So it's not a box wine kind of a thing. It's no. <laughs> um, but did you talk about yeast? Well, I used I used the seventy uh, one B. Uh, I think it's the I hope it's the Narbonne strain. Hope I'm not saying that wrong or getting it wrong, but it's a it's a white wine yeast, um, and it's kind of the go to yeast amongst the the greats and near greats in the wine. I mean, in the mead making world. Mm -hmm. I remember last year when we sat in the uh, mead. I think you were with me, but I was there at any rate <laughs> in the in the mead makers panel, and they had you know all the the greats up there. And pretty much they all use 71B. It's like, yeah, I use 71B for my meads. Mm -hmm. And um, I will admit that up until that time, I didn't really, I would use a Cote de Blanc, which I really like. And I still, and does make a good mead. And I like to make meads with uh, ale yeast as well. Mm -hmm. But the 71B, I think, really does do a tremendous job of keeping the uh, honey notes in the mead. It doesn't dry the mead out as bad as uh, champagne yeast does. I used to make mead uh, years ago. I, I, you know, the recipe is all called for champagne yeast. You put champagne yeast in it, uh, and that certainly does do a good job. But the champagne yeast will really dry that mead out, just bone dry, and kind of strip all the flavor out too. If you ask me, unless you start off with a giant amount of, you know, high gravity, uh, yeah. and that's where I think the champagne yeast would come in handy. Is if if you needed to eat a ton of sugar. Yeah, for sure. And um, so I've just kind of got, I've gotten away from using champagne yeast. I, I like to use yeast that kind of give up the ghost at around 13% um, or beer yeast that give up the ghost around 11% and uh, it still give you a nice clean fermentation. And I think 71B does. And you always add yeast nutrient and take care of your yeast. Yeah, you really want, I mean, just like in a, in a beer fermentation, you really want a really good, aggressive fermentation. Um, again, going back to, you know, when I started, when you started making meads, it, you know, we didn't know about such things necessarily. At least I didn't. And so the fermentations would take forever and the meads would taste like rubber bands for a <laughs> long time. Uh, but if you, if you treat that yeast with respect, basically, and give it, give it a good diet, give it some vitamins, some magnesium sulfate, things like that, uh, the yeast will perform aggressively. You'll get through the fermentation in a few weeks. Um, it'll be an aggressive fermentation. And 
and the mead will clear out and be ready to drink much more quickly than you know I would have expected or one would have expected uh, even a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And of course, and of course, I'm sure that there are people out there going, "Oh no, I knew that 20 years ago." I'm sure of that. <laughs> I, I can only speak from you know from my experience and kind of growing up in the hobby. And uh, a little of this is is uh, rechewing our cabbage from previous episodes, sure. but you don't use the the step nutrient you add all your nutrients at the beginning yeah i just do that because it's simpler and frankly i just i feel like i get a good product um and i don't have to worry about the one-third sugar break and Mm. i mean there's some there's some reasons to do it and i think that there's some equally compelling reasons not to do it that way and if you if you add too much nutrient too late in the process you end up with uric acid basically Mm. and it'll taste like pee yeah yeah i i had that happen actually uh uh, Matt Whitey, uh, we we were uh, had him at the uh, is it the last last times yeah. last year's uh, conference. Yeah, uh, we tasted his meads and they were wonderful. And then I said, "Oh, let me share this little mead that I've got." And he said, "You know," and he was very diplomatic, but he was like, "I t- I smell a little uric acid." There's a when did you do the nutrients and all that? And that, then I smelled it, uh, the mead, and then I did. It was like, "Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. I get it." It's, it's I added. Too much nutrient, too late in the process. There is there is a risk. Yeah. So um, so yeah. That's why I I'm just I, I won't say I'm lazy, but I, I like the certainty of what I'm doing. Um, it works for me, and I'm also I'm comfortable again going back to being a retail store owner. I'm comfortable telling folks that have never made made meat before how to do it this way, and I'm more comfortable with that than telling them to read their hydrometer and find the sugar break. And, and, you know, if you mess that up and then you've invested all that time and money, I want them to have a good experience. Mm. And, uh, and I'm the same way. I want to have a good experience. So, um, so that's the cherry meat. So yeah, what do you think? It's, it's delicious. It's very drinkable. Uh, and it's light enough to have like on a summer day, you know? Uh, so it's not like, you know, a big giant dessert mead that, uh, you want to sip with, uh, you know, at the end of the meal and, uh, but this is like, it's, and it, but again, it's not, it, it's not like a soft drink, uh, you know, and that there's, there's more to it than, than, you know, just, um, you know, a flavored beverage. Uh, so it's very nice, very drinkable. And I think it's, uh, you know, very sessionable. Now this one is, is a redder color. That one was, um, the red in there. It almost had a, has a, would you say it almost has a br- kind of a brown tinge to it, just a little bit? Yeah, but- and I think that that might be. I think that might be because uh, when I pulled the sample, I think I stirred up some of the yeast. Ah. It was very, very clear mm. when I pulled the very first sample out of it, and then filled our little bottles tonight. Uh, but I think I stirred up a little bit of the lees, and I think that that's what you're seeing. So before I bottled this for real. I will. Um, I'm sure I'll probably hit it with a little bit of uh, um, fining agent. You know, probably dual fine. That's the kind I like to use. The brand I use, and you know, cold crash it and let it get really bright, and then bottle it. And actually, this this cherry mead and then this blueberry mead, um, we'll be drinking those at my son's college graduation in a month. So yay, 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 Chase. So this. <laughs> 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 That's the second show that I could think of that I spoke into the glass rather than the, than the microphone. Uh, this is is re- red, so it's but it's blueberry. But it's blueberry, and it's it's um, it's the real color. So in other words, this is the one I mentioned earlier that I just I just made the kit. So it's seven and a half pounds of honey, and this is a, a wild Arkansas honey mm-hmm. that we get. Well, I say wild; it's it's raw honey. Uh, but it's uh, it's not a factory honey, I guess I'll put it that way, uh, that I'm able to sell. And um, it's got a it's a three gallon batch again, seven and a half pounds of wildflower honey, a teaspoon of yeast energizer, two teaspoons of yeast nutrient, um, two packs of seventy one B. It started at ten eighty six. It finished at one thousand. Uh, so I calculated that to be eleven point two seven percent alcohol. Mm. And um, I started this on the 31st of January of this year. And I let it go for quite a while. Let me, I'm looking at my notes here. Uh, 
on the 21st of February, I racked it onto two gallons of frozen Arkansas blueberries. So in other words, these were blueberries from last year's farmer's market that I still had the freezer and one to use up. I left them on the fruit for 10 days. Uh, so, and then I racked it back into a, a secondary or a tertiary. And I, my note here on the day I racked is, wow, this is delicious. <laughs> So I've got here on the 12th of April, so not very many days ago, um, that my my note is after secondary fermentation, it is very dry, hmm. going to flavor and back sweeten with 32 ounces of, of organic blueberry juice, uh, which the the 32 ounce jar of blueberry juice, by the way, calculates out to 2.71 ounces ounces of sugar. Huh. So I I finally you know kind of got smart and said, well, I need to figure out how much sugar that's going to provide. So it, it, it's just a little less than three ounces of sugar that I put back into the mead already after it had been stabilized. And then I did the same thing again when I bottled this on the fly. I added about a teaspoon of honey to the bottle. And this is, uh, a, I guess, a 10-ounce bottle, I suppose. So If that. If that. It's might a be, small bottle. might be seven. I'm yeah. not even sure. It's like a, one of those little bitty baby Coke bottles that you used yeah. to see. Yeah. So, uh, so definitely on the fly, definitely to see – what back sweetening would do to it. I'd already had it. It's a dry mead and it was delicious, but I wanted to see what would happen if I back sweetened it. And here we are. So, uh, this will be the first time I've tasted it. Oh. Dramatic pause. Yeah, no kidding. Ooh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's really good. Um, wow. I, it's very aromatic. There's a lot of, there's, it smells really good. Boy, it does. And I haven't, um, I guess I'm still planning to hit this with a little bit of the fresh, uh, the new black, I mean, the blueberry juice, mm. but this isn't, this is just honey and blueberries mm. with a little bit of back sweetening. That's all that's in this right now. So has this been stabilized? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's stabilized. It's not going to ferment. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's done. It's, it's a still mead. And again, um, going back to that little tart cherry mead, I started that out with the idea of just playing with a recipe for the store, then thinking, oh, this will make a nice sparkling mead that I can serve at the barbecue that you know people will like, and then deciding that it was a little too thin hmm. for that, and so I needed to get the body back up and get, get the cherry flavor back into it. Um, so the experiment in terms of producing a kit for the store kind of failed. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, 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 the recipe that I put together to see if I could turn that into a kit didn't work. Hmm. But that doesn't mean that the meat isn't any good. So that's part of, again, to me, that's part of the fun of the hobby is saying, well, here, here's what I've done. Now, what's good about this? What can I do to fix it? Or fixing isn't even necessarily the right word because mm. the fermentation was good. Um, it was clean. It had a nice, pleasant taste. It just wasn't enough. So I decided to up the ante in terms of flavor. Mm. And then with this blueberry mead, um, all I've done at the moment is stabilize it and back sweeten it. Mm. So I may leave it alone. I mean, it tastes really nice. It's really good. Yeah. Um, and at 11 point whatever percent, yeah, it is super drinkable. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not, it's not, it's got a, a nice balance of sweet and tart. Um, but it, I drink my little sample in, in a hurry and this may be the this may be the proper size bottle for the and I think these may be seven ounces. I think, I think they're seven. They're, they're very small. Yeah, but for especially for a, for a, like a cookout with a bunch of young people around, maybe <laughs> maybe small bottles of this would be better. Well, that's exactly what I was thinking. I mean, that's truly what I was thinking. It would be nice to have a cooler full of these little bottles of something that's kind of fun to drink and you know not too challenging, I guess, for lack of a better word and. And um, I thought it'd be fun to do, and so here we are playing with it. Yeah, yeah, you'd need a need a little sign warning. These, you know, eleven <laughs> percent, uh, because uh, you know it could be the you know PGA punch of uh, you know uh, the uh, you know more legitimate uh, PGA punch if you're not careful. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, where you know, and I don't know if people are familiar with PGA punch anymore, but that's where you take Hawaiian punch. And you mix it in with some fruit and some pure grain alcohol, and then you, you know, clean up the party afterwards and scoop up your friends who are lying on their, you know, it's yeah. terrible, terrible, terrible stuff uh, for a lot of different reasons. But 
uh, yeah, something this delicious um, and fairly high in alcohol, you need to make sure that people know what they're what they're drinking. But man, well done. It's very clean, cleanly fermented. I mean, there's just you know, there's nothing, no off flavors to ding it at all. It's just very drinkable and uh, tart and a little bit sweet and fruity and man, really good. Well, thanks. Um, you know, that's one of the things that I I find with with meads. I've I've gotten in the habit of buying as many commercial meads as I can find. So when I see one that I haven't had before around here locally, I I tend to buy a bottle and try it. And there are some people making some wonderful meads out there. Hmm. There are also some people making some not so wonderful meads, mm. and uh, they can be too too sweet, too cloying. Uh, which sweet is okay, but but there's a balance that you have to find. Um, I had one the other day uh, from somewhere, and I don't even re- remember the the meadery, but it was it actually had kind of an off flavor in it that oh. I think was a, a yeast stress thing. Wow! I think mm. it just had it, you know. Of course, after a a nice big glass of it. I didn't notice it anymore, <laughs> but uh, but it had there was a, in the nose. Uh, you could you could kind of smell it, and uh, it was not a pleasant smell. And so maybe that could be from the variety of honey. Maybe it could be from a little bit of, of a strain on the yeast. You know, some esters that were coming off that. I don't know what, but um, nobody likes a smelly ester. <laughs> nobody likes a smelly ester. I can tell you. <laughs> now, now fruity ester. <laughs> So, okay, so let's move along. So <laughs> well, on that note, speaking of fruity esters. <laughs> now, this one is even, uh, has an, an even little browner. to, And when I say brown, I mean the actual color, not the clarity of the thing. But it's got a little, right. uh, it's a little browner. It's a little browner. And again, I, I'm certain I stirred up a little bit of the leaves when I pulled it. But, excuse me. Uh, but also, it's interesting how things look when they're real things. The, the real color of cherries that have been uh, had the color pulled out of them into the fermented product isn't bright red. Mm-hmm. If it is bright red, you might want to wonder how it's been doctored, mm. perhaps. Um, with the blueberry mead, I, you know, I would have expected that to have that kind of really dark, to look like a, blue, a blueberry is almost black. There's, mm-hmm. It's so dark. Well, not really. At least not with, not in a three gallon batch with two gallons of blueberries. It 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 made almost a cherry color. Mm-hmm. So it's very interesting. Again, with this one, you know, when I bottle it for real, it'll settle out. It'll I'm sure it will be a bright, uh, bright color. Um, but this is the this is the mead that is thirteen point eight six percent officially. So I'll call it fourteen percent. And uh, it's about a year old. I, mm-hmm. I won't even try to look at my notes on it. But I do remember that it has uh, 14 pounds of honey. Maybe 15, but I think it's 14. Um, and it is um, 71B. I may look that up and correct myself. But I'm, I'm almost certain it's 71B. And um, seven pounds of Montana cherries, huh. uh, which our buddy Joe Covey uh, mm-hmm. there you go. brought to me. And so, yeah, he and his dad picked them straight from the tree, I think. Yes, they did. So it's the real deal. Um, but what I did is I racked off half that meat and gave it to Joe, which is our deal. And this is my half. And the interesting thing here is that I've racked it then onto um, medium French oak. Huh. So, in, in what form? Uh, in a stave or, a, or actually a spiral. Hmm. So it's a, again, it's a product that I sell. It's, I really like these little spirals, they're little sticks that are about, six or so inches long um and they're they've got like a spiral cut into the wood so there's a lot of surface area Mm. and uh it's very convenient way to put some oak into your uh beverage whether it's beer or wine or whatever it might be or whatever you're making and uh around these parts and uh yeah (laughs) up in the hills Mm. Mm. anyway you can you can add some oak and uh it's not as messy as the chips and so i I like it and we're going to find out how it tastes okay so let's do and again i i I did back sweeten this just ever so slightly uh at bottling so my question is, I guess the, those spirals are easy to, to put down into a carboy. Mm-hmm. How easy are they to get out of the carboy? 
They're really easy, actually, to be mm. honest. I, I was surprised. I, I've used them a couple of times now in beers. And the first time I dropped a couple of them into a car, I thought, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be there for a I'm while. I'm going to have to get the arm, you know, and go to an arcade and get the arm to drop down and pick up the monkey. But... <laughs> That's a cool, that's a that's a phrase you don't hear much anymore. No, you don't. <laughs> Time to pick up the monkey. <laughs> but uh, but actually, they 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 just come out. You just turn the carboy upside down, and they'll kind of come out. <laughs> or you could shock the monkey. <laughs> or shock the monkey. <laughs> Peter, no, well, this is a family not. show. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> so I don't know what this is going to be like. Again, I've not tasted it since it's been on the oak. I think it's a good mead. We'll see what the oak did oh, to it. Oh my. Oh. <laughs> he's he's trying to talk into the glass again, folks. <laughs> I smelled the microphone. <laughs> um, oh my goodness! Yeah this this ha- this has some some alcohol to it. You can smell the alcohol. Woo! And the oak. It smells like um, a malt. It, this, this is like a whiskey or something. It smells. I haven't tasted it, but it's it's powerful. This. This will set you free. This is my favorite. Wow. I'm mm. very, very pleased. Wow. That, <laughs> that's, wow. I'm still, I took a little sip and I'm still tasting things. You know, it's mm-hmm. still, there's, um, you get the oak. I get a little bit of chocolate and tobacco. Yeah. I mean, I, I hate saying, I hate talking like this because I sound like a, yeah. a poser. Snooty. But, but, but I do. It's like, it's like, um, like pipe tobacco and uh, chocolate and oak and, but there's also fruit. There's, there's a lot of cherry in there too. Yeah. Um, I'm very pleased at how mm. enormously more complex this is. So I drank some of this a few days ago. Well, or I should say be, before I oaked it. So when I, I took a little sample, drank a little bit, you know, at the end of the day at the store. And I was like, okay, that's really good. I'm going to put some oak on it. Um, but I thought it was kind of boozy. Hmm. Um, I think that the little bit of honey that I hit it with to back sweeten it has softened that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe. But, um, but the oak has... There's a multiplier effect in terms of the complexity that it brought to the cherries, that it brought to the honey. Um, it doesn't taste boozy anymore to me. It doesn't taste hot, though I can tell it's a strong drink. Right. This is definitely a strong drink. The nose is a little bit hot, but the flavor is not. It, yeah. And it, there's a bourbon character that, that comes through, too. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So, boy, yeah. To, you know, I think... Cherry pipe tobacco a little bit, very mm. lightly. Oh, um, Joe should be very happy. Well, his isn't on oak. Oh, he might, he might decide to do that after he hears this. I don't know, <laughs> but his is just the straight stuff. Wow. So wow, yeah. that's that's really good. I think really good. I think the lesson between these three very different meads is. Mm to uh be open to the be open to the moment mm. to find a way to bring out the best in what you've already done saying okay here's what i've got and this is good but now what, what do i do next what do i do next to bring the flavor out or to accentuate the the positive accentuate the, <laughs> the positive, positive. <laughs> you know how do you how do you go about that and 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 not to kind of get your head down uh, particularly in that first little mead, the little seven percent mead, really dry, really, really not a lot of body. I mean, it was okay, and I was not unhappy with it, but uh, it's much superior to to how it was. But I think that that of the three, this this last one's really the that's that's good stuff. Wow, and it's and it's a dessert. I would classify it as a dessert mead, but it's not super sweet. Mm-mm. I mean, there's enough sweetness to balance everything else that's going in there yeah but it's not like a syrupy sweet kind of a a thing no it really isn't and in fact i would still have this um i would drink this as a primary uh wine drink say with a thanksgiving dinner Mm -hmm. traditional american thanksgiving dinner would be good it'd also be really good with uh, thai food 
Huh. You know, with really spicy yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Asian food, I think it would be really good with that. It'd also be really good with like chocolate cake. <laughs> <laughs> or a hamburger. Or a hamburger. <laughs> what are you doing in a little while? Yeah. <laughs> the Denny's is closed down the street. so we can... <laughs> um, Wow. That's really good. Um, now, should we... Now, we're in a quandary here because I, I only brought two sampling glasses, but I want to save this. I don't want to, I don't want to dump it or, yeah. or, or, or slam it. Right. Um, so shall I get, uh, shall we, we do a little break and then and get a couple more sample glasses before yeah. we do the last one? Yeah. Then we've got one okay, more we'll, we'll, take a, we'll take a short pause, which will be uh, unnoticeable to the listener. Okay, I'm, I'm back with the glasses. And uh, my my lovely wife Susan followed me up, so she's sampling the previous ones. Uh, so you might might uh, hear hear uh, noises of approval over there. From <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's one of my favorite bands. Noises of approval. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're like Toad the Wet Sprocket. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> Back in the nineties. I think yeah. they're going to open for them in Kansas City on <laughs> August the fourth. <4th. laughs> okay. Okay. So here's our last one of the night, and so. <laughs> Uh, again, we've already done shows on this, but I had a 12-pack left, and I thought it would be fun to try it again. Again, Ooh. part of the fun of the hobby is to try these things over time, see how they change and how they evolve. So this is a sizer that I put together on 18th of September of the previous year, 2017. Three-gallon batch, three gallon apple ci- three gallons of apple cider, or I should say 24 ounces of local light raw honey topped up to three gallons with cider, sweet cider. A tablespoon and a half of a teaspoon and a half of pectic enzyme, half a teaspoon of yeast nutrient, a half a teaspoon of yeast energizer, and a one five gram pack of saf cider cider yeast. It started out at ten seventy, it finished at a thousand, and I calculated that to be nine point one seven percent. At bottling, I added a little bit of ginger extract to taste, and as I recall, it was about an ounce and a half. Um, I carbonated this, so this is our only sparkling mead of the oh. night. Uh, and I used the uh, carb drops, oh. the, the the kind of the big carb drops, the right. one to a bottle. The candy thing. The candy thing, yeah. And uh, But before I did all that, I racked it onto five uh, pounds of crisp and apples for two weeks. And then I did the carbonation thing. I bottled it on, the, on December the 6th of 2017. And it's... It's beautiful. Yeah. So oh, yeah. Carbonated. Nice and pretty. Cheers. Nice light yellow color. Reminds <laughs> me of our Frank Zappa song from many years ago. <laughs> what would you? <laughs> it looks like you're. <laughs> you might need to drink more water. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> taste. The apples are really mm. coming out in that. Wow. Way more than they did a few months ago. And the, and the ginger is uh, blending nicely. Yes, it is. Along with the Marianne. And <laughs> I couldn't resist that. Okay. Mm. That's very good. It's, it's dried out uh, a little bit, I would say. Yeah, it has. It's not as sweet as it was. Nope, it's not. Um, it's very apple-y. Mm-hmm. I'm surprised at how how the apples are coming out in it. Um, wow, it's good. Yeah, it's delightful. It's delightful. It's not my favorite. No. Of the night. Uh, well, just because we're coming off of that very, yeah, very complex, it's yeah. just it's not an it, it's unfair. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's, we should have, we should have done this. We should have saved that that big cherry one for last. <laughs> it's like it's like putting the opening band at the end of the concert. It's yeah, not fair. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but there's not. But on the other hand, so now to go back to things more positive, there's nothing wrong with this. There's, it's no. not the the fermentation's good. The carbonation's nice. The apple flavor is good. The ginger is working with it okay. Um. Yeah, it's it's very nice, and the carbonation really adds a, a bit of brightness mm-hmm. uh, to the ginger and the apple flavor. 
uh, that really, um, you know, it gives a tartness. It's, it's like a tart apple. You know, it's not a sweet apple, yet it's not as stringent. You know, it's not so dry that it's, um, you know, it'll pucker you up. Uh, but it's, again, it's nicely drinkable. Actually, now that I've had a chance for my palate to adjust, I'll go back to saying how wonderful it is. <laughs> <laughs> You've it's washed actually, away all the all the, all the, the bourbony, uh, oaky yeah. Uh, goodness. Yeah, it's actually it's actually quite good. Um, I'm not sure what I'd do differently. I might wish it had a little bit more sweetness in it, um, but because I chose to carbonate it, and that's the thing that we can visit for a moment is that you can't you can't have a back sweetened mead and a carbonated mead Mm -hmm. unless you're going to force carbonate it in a kegging system. You can back sweeten a mead. You can stabilize it, back sweeten it, and force carbonate it if you you keg. Mm -hmm. But if you're a bottler like I am, then you have to do one or the other. You can't do both. So, um, you know, put that in your pipe and smoke it. It's just, <laughs> it's just how it is. And I and I do have customers that will ask me. They really want. You know, I really want this to be sweeter, but I also want to carbonate it. And then I have to break the news that you just can't do that. Yeah, it's a big balance. I mean, if you want a this is in a, in a way champagne-y in that it is um, lighter in body and sparkling and effervescent and you know it's got all that going on for it. If you wanted. You know, a sweet mead with carbonation, man, you'd have to do some math, you know, to to make sure that the that the yeast, you know, reached its tolerance for fermenting all that sugar right at the time that it was perfectly carbonated. Otherwise, you're going to have bottle bombs. Yeah, for sure. So, in fact, that opens up a whole new topic of, you know, how do you how do you make the mead as sweet as you want it to be? And so, of course, one way is to overwhelm the yeast with so much honey that it dies out naturally and you get what you get, which is a great way, which is great. Uh, b- but for someone that doesn't do it with great regularity, meaning uh, you really know what you're doing, it's a lot safer to brew the, and brew is not the right word, I guess, but maze. to make, to, to <laughs> maze the mead to, to dry, let it completely ferment out and then stabilize it and back sweeten it. Mm-hmm. I think you do have to be careful that if you back sweeten it and don't let it mature for a, a period of time, it will have kind of a raw honey taste. But that will eventually dro- drop out, and the, and the mead will the flavors will meld, and it will taste natural, mm. which is what you want. Well, all these were delicious, as uh, as expected. Um, keep on doing what you're doing with the meads. I mean, you're you know you're stretching your legs. I I, I feel you know uh in, inadequate in, in your uh, in the uh presence of your mead making ability but uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> but i don't do it enough that's the thing is i did, you know i i don't make enough meads to to know what i'm doing or to you know or to, or to start riffing on the things that i've learned well um i i i understand what you're saying and, and i feel the same way about the beer experiments that you're doing so you're doing things that I've never thought about um, with beer, and they come out great. So, but I, I would also say this that that I'm having a great time doing this. Part of it is to expand my knowledge so I can help my customers. Part of it's just because I really like to drink mead. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also, it's it's just the journey of it, and I think that's what you have to be open to if you're going to get into this hobby, whether it's beer or wine or mead. I mean, it really is a journey, and. You're going to get better at it over time. You're going to find the things that work for you and don't work for you. And everybody's brew house is a little different. So, you know, fermentation temperatures, just, you know, the, the house flavor that you get, you know, uh, is going to be different in everybody's uh, setting. And um, so for me, the the journey is the fun part, not necessarily the destination. Although I like it when we land on a good, on a good <laughs> bottle, but I would also say that, uh, I don't, I'm not any great expert. There are a lot of people out there that are really, really good at this. And if you buy one book in your life and you want to make mead buy Ken Tram's the complete mead maker. Mm. So there's a plug for Ken. Um, you know, his book is very well written. The information is accurate and good. Um, and I 
try to get my you know young mead makers to invest in that book if they will because because their meads will be better and so I guess the point of that little commercial is buy his book from me. <laughs> but but uh, <laughs> the point of it is that there's a lot of information out there. A lot of the information is bad. Mm. And a lot of the information will will cost you time and money and bad mead. So uh, go, to the, go to a source that's really good. Go to Ken Tran's book. There are other folks out there, too, that know what they're doing. And uh, hopefully I know what I'm doing a little bit and can help you, too. <laughs> well, good luck on your journey, and don't stop believing. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to go get my Bon Jovis out. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Thank you, James. Thanks again to Steve. I need to, I, I need to play around with oaking more because that oaked Melamal was amazing. Uh, pretty incredible. I appreciate Steve sharing his meads and his knowledge and his friendship. It's always fun to get together. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form at basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check all that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. Be sure to check out our DVDs, extract brewing and partial mashing, stepping into all grain, low-tech lagering and decoction mashing, and introduction to wine kits. You can find them all on our site. Get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo, and you can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store, too. You can find our log books where you can track and log up to 50 batches of beer. Check all that out at basicbrewingshop.com. Don't forget you're going to join the American Homebrewers Association and subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links at basicbrewing.com. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson, Basic Brewing Radio. It's a production of Active Voice, and we'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. Mm-hmm.